On Tuesday, June 4th, 2019, longtime friends Kate Brown and Carnell Sledge met up at a peaceful spot next to the Rocky River in the Cleveland Metro Parks on the west side of Cleveland, Ohio. The two friends met up after arriving separately about 5.04 p.m. Sometime within the next 4 to 11 minutes, they were both shot to death. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. As of the release date of this episode of Great Lakes True Crime, we recently marked the four-year anniversary of this senseless, tragic double murder. And there are two reasons why this case was picked to be covered at the podcast at this time. One, because it's unsolved. The second reason is that this case garnered lots of media attention when it happened, and for the first three years after that, they maintained that attention. A Google search revealed that many local media stories could be found marking the first, second, and third anniversaries of the deaths of Kate and Carnell. However, that same Google search comes up empty for any media stories on the four-year mark. This is a fairly short episode, even by my standards, and that's because there simply isn't a whole lot of information to report, but it is important that we keep this story out there. Kate Brown was 33 years old and Carnell Sledge was 40 at the time of their deaths. The two arrived at a parking lot located just north of Lorraine Road along the Valley Parkway inside the park at approximately 5.04 p.m. They came separately and took a seat on a park bench overlooking the river. Carnell drove to the meeting location after he got off work that day. It's unclear how Kate arrived at the site, but we do know that the two came separately and presumably came from different locations. It is believed that someone fatally shot Kate and Carnell sometime between 5.08 p.m. and 5.15 p.m., so possibly less than five minutes after they sat down. Their bodies were discovered at 5.22 p.m. by two kayakers that were out paddling on the Rocky River. They immediately called 911 and reported what they found. The kayakers told police that they did not see or hear anything unusual at the time of the murders, including not hearing any gunshots. The two bodies were not immediately next to one another when they were found. Kate was shot in the head one time, and her remains were found on the edge of the river. Carnell had been shot multiple times in the head, and was about 20 yards away from Kate, on the riverbank still near that bench, suggesting that at least one of them, probably Kate, had tried to run from their assailants. It should be noted that Cleveland Metro Parks is a very popular network of parks surrounding the greater Cleveland area, as well as the city of Cleveland itself. Because of the way the parks circle the city, the Metro Parks are commonly referred to as the Emerald Necklace. The area where these shootings occurred is not isolated. It's a very busy park area with an all-purpose trail running along it, the river with kayakers and paddleboards on it, and several popular golf courses nearby. Not to mention all the cars driving along the parkway. Because it connects many densely populated areas in Cleveland, so the fact that these two were killed in broad daylight in an area with lots of people around is surprising, not to mention alarming. Because of these circumstances, police wanted to avert any public panic by holding a press conference two days after the murders. In that press conference, investigators stressed that the shooting was an isolated incident in the popular recreation destination. Nearly three weeks after the murders, on June 24, 2019, no arrests had been made in the double homicide, 
and another press conference was held by Cleveland Metro Parks Police, as well as the Cleveland Office of the FBI. Both agencies renewed their pleas for help in identifying the killer or killers, asking anyone with information to please come forward. It was also during this press conference that Metro Parks Police Chief Catherine Dolan and Cleveland FBI Special Agent in Charge Eric Smith explained that they determined the time of the meeting to have been 5.04 p.m. and that the time of death had been between 5.08 p.m. and 5.15, although they wouldn't say how they arrived at those conclusions. The investigators reaffirmed their belief that someone must have seen something, Quote, it's in a highly trafficked area, especially in the late afternoon and early evening weekday hours, Agent Smith said. There are numerous joggers, walkers, bicyclists, kayakers, and even vehicles cutting through the area to avoid interstate backups, and this is true to this area on any given day. The agent followed that up by saying, quote, there was plenty of people and plenty of activity in the park. So, early news reports stated that Carnell's family was unaware of his friendship with Kate, and they didn't know Kate at all. They supposedly had never heard of her before. During the press conference, however, this narrative was disputed when police advised that the man and woman had been friends for over 10 years, and their relationship had always been platonic. In the days and weeks following the highly publicized murders, the FBI and Cleveland Metro Parks Police tried to minimize public panic about a potentially random double homicide in a popular park used by thousands of people. In that earlier press conference, Metro Parks Police Chief Dolan gave an assurance that there was no immediate danger to the public, which gave rise to speculation that investigators either knew or suspected that the killings were not random attacks. The reporters from several news outlets asked both Chief Dolan and FBI agent Smith whether investigators believed the killings were targeted, but the answers asserted that the nature of the ongoing investigation precluded them from answering those questions. Agent Smith did, however, reassure the public that he had no reason to believe the attacks were random, which seemed to indirectly answer the questions about whether Carnell and Kate were targeted. Based on this information, a question comes up as to how or why police could reassure the public that they were not in any danger. How did they know this to be true? Or did they know this to be true? In other words, did they know something about this being a targeted attack? Or were they just providing these reassurances without any reason to do so or any backing behind them? Other questions that went unanswered in the press conference include how many credible tips the investigators received, whether they had any suspects in mind, or whether the pair were robbed of any personal belongings before or after the shootings. Again, the ongoing investigation was given as the reason for not answering many of the inquiries. Metro Parks Police Chief Dolan did reassure the public that they could safely use the Metro Parks, though, citing the fact that that no other murders had been committed in the park system in over two decades. Carnell Sledge, who again was 40 years old at the time of his death, was a huge fan of all Cleveland sports teams. He worked for a company that installs audiovisual equipment in homes and businesses, but also volunteered his time with a nonprofit that provides mental health services to children and adults. He had also worked in special education in a suburban Cleveland school district for about five years. Carnell was described by one friend as the sort of man who lit up every room he walked into. He always managed to be the center of attention, even without trying to or seeking the limelight. Another friend described him as kind, genuine, and compassionate. Yet another friend described Carnell as a rare type of person, one who touched many lives, who loved helping people from all walks of life, and was always optimistic. She said Carnell once sent her a pep talk via email, in which he said, quote, don't pursue happiness, create it. 
Of all Carnell's friends and co-workers, none knew of anything that would suggest he had enemies or was in any type of danger. Kate Brown was described by friends as someone who had a love for art, animals of all types, and her family. According to Kate's father, Tom, Kate, quote, had her demons, but had recently lost over 100 pounds through diet and exercise and had been sober for over two years at the time of her death. Essentially, she was at the top of her game. Kate's sister, Alex, expressed some frustration with the pace of the investigation and communication to her family from law enforcement after a while. She said, quote, When they actually had data to give us, they would call us, but then as time has gone on, it has slowly gotten more and more quiet. Years later, Alex still feels the pain of losing her sister. She said, You deal with the pain, but it never, ever, ever ceases to feel. It takes your breath away. Remembering that this happened and that she will never be at a family party again or you can't call her, it's the worst feeling in the world, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And Kate's mother, Kim, is not giving up hope. Someday we will get justice, she said. I know deep down that it will happen. This is a truly baffling and frustrating case. There seems to be no known suspects and no obvious motive. We have found out over time that robbery doesn't seem to have been a motive. Nothing valuable was taken from the victims or their vehicles. Cleveland Metro Park's police say they have conducted over 200 interviews related to this case. So they are, by their account, putting in a lot of effort to solve this case. Yet they still have released very other information on the status of their investigations which again has gone on for over four years now. We do know that several shell casings were found at the site, but not much else about any physical evidence that may have been uncovered. Carnell's body was found right by the bench after having been shot twice in the head. Kate's body was found down by the edge of the river. This suggests again that Carnell may have been approached from behind and shot first, and then Kate was shot while running away. Local media did come up with a potential tip, though. In 2021, TV station Fox 8 Cleveland received an anonymous letter stating that the person who sent the letters knows that the shooter was a woman and provided a very detailed description of what the woman was wearing that day. In looking into this further, though, It seems that the letter writer was not an eyewitness, but rather a psychic who had a vision about the crimes. Different people may put different levels of belief in the ability of psychics. To me, if this letter really was from a psychic, it is of little value in solving this case. Speculation about motives runs rampant on internet message boards. Some people have suggested perhaps this was a racially motivated hate crime as Carnell and Kate were of different races. Perhaps someone saw the pair, assumed that they were dating or married, and became so enraged that he killed them. But interracial couples are certainly not uncommon in this area, so it seems unlikely that this was the case. This is especially true when you consider that the killer would have had to have known when they arrived at the park, then killed them, and then left all within a few minutes. Others have speculated that a forlorn lover killed the two, either an ex or maybe someone who wanted to date one of the two and was rejected. Perhaps this person followed one of the two and killed them when they met up at the park. Given the short period of time between the pair's arrival at the park and the shootings, it seems likely that at least one of the two were followed there if this was a targeted killing. Of course, it's also possible that someone went out and randomly killed two people for whatever reason they have or no reason at all, sort of a thrill kill type of killing. With the public nature of this attack in broad daylight on a beautiful June afternoon, the killer or killers must be very brazen. In any case, somebody must have seen or heard something that day in 2019 or sometime since then from someone involved in this crime. 
Anyone with information on the murders of Carnell Sledge and Kate Brown can call the Cleveland FBI at area code 216-522-1400 or the Metro Parks Police dedicated tip line at area code 440-331-5219 or you can call Crime Stoppers at area code 216-252-7463 In either of these cases, tipsters can remain anonymous, and there is a $100,000 reward for information that helps solve these crimes. If you want to hear more about this case, the podcast True Crime Garage does a deeper dive into the case and spends more time discussing potential motives in their episode number 660. Check that out if you're interested. Before we go... I did want to recommend a four-part TV series that we just finished watching. It's called For Her Sins, and is currently on Channel 5 in England. I haven't heard which platform it'll be on yet in the U.S. and Canada, but I'm sure it's coming soon. For Her Sins involves a normal, middle-class family that seems to be doing pretty well until a charismatic stranger happens to come into their lives. Things start to unravel and go off the rails. People, marriages, friendships. As you start to learn that there is a dark history among several of the characters, and it eventually all comes to light, it's definitely worth a watch if you get a chance. So keep an eye out for For Her Sins. That's all for this episode of Great Lakes True Crime. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Great Lakes True Crime. You can also check out links in the show notes for sources and more information. Also, you may notice a bit of rebranding for the show. I'm trying to move a little bit away from the darkness with a little more upbeat kind of logo. Thanks to those of you who recently left positive reviews through your podcast app. I appreciate those. And if you do like the show, please tell a friend about it. And also, we recently received several donations, and those are super appreciated as they help keep the show going. You can email me at greatlakestruecrime at gmail.com with any thoughts on this case or suggestions for other cases to cover. For Great Lakes True Crime, this has been Steve, your host and producer. Thanks for listening, guys. (laughs) 